Right, folks, welcome back. Same uh, proviso as before. Do not watch this, please, if this is going to cause you any distress or mental anxiety. Instead, go and study for your next exam, or even better, if you can, go and enjoy the remains of study league before it disappears. Um, these are just my guesses, not the official SQA question. Answer, sorry, I make mistakes, as you've noticed from the past, so you can't use these to accurately judge your mark, I'm afraid. All right, let's start. Advanced higher paper two. Well, that's good fluffy noises with the paper, hey? Uh, explain, in terms of energy levels, why red light is emitted by lithium. Hang on two seconds, let me fix my seat. Okay, it's emitted by lithium ions when distress flows about, I think, uh, one mark maybe for heat promoting electrons. Uh, and then as the electrons fall back down again to their base or the ground state, uh, red light is emitted. I think, not entirely sure. As I said, I'm not the SQA. Uh, this one here. Complete the table below showing the quantum numbers and values for a net a lithium atom, a lithium ion, sorry, in its ground state. So lithium ions, oh yeah, and my two is not acceptable, and that's why they've said lithium ions, because lithium ions have only got two electrons, which means they must, they must both be 1s electrons. So can't be 2s, silly old fool. That's why the ground state's there, of course. It's got to be one, and that is the symbol ms. Uh, what we got here, how many marks was that? That was just one mark, so I assume you need to know both. Which is a bit harsh, because they are different learning outcomes. Then again, it's advanced higher, isn't it? It's not a walk in the park. Perchlorate, uh, oxidizing agent, uh, just run through the... Sorry, uh, the chlorate ion here. Uh, ClO4 minus, so there's one chlorine that we don't know, there's four oxygens, and the whole thing adds up to minus one. That's plus seven. Yeah, that's pretty spicy. That would be why it's good at oxidising other things, because it itself wants to reduce this oxidation number. Um, the number of sigma bonds. I, I may have got this one wrong. This one almost seems too easy to me, but correct me if I've got it wrong in the comments. Each one of these bonds is a sigma bond, and the doubles are a sigma and a pi bond. So I'm just counting nine, but feel free to point out my mistakes. They certainly happen, that's for sure. Uh, this one here... Looks like just, I think, again, I'm not sure, that's, am I missing something here? Delta H is minus 824. Um, delta S is a bit more like it. We have to actually add up 824 times 2, sorry. Um, do we, we have to add up the total entropy of all the products and then deduct the total entropy of all the reactants. I did this late last night. It's entirely possible these are not correct. Um, so I apologize if that's the case. I got minus 549, minus two lots of that. You pop these numbers into here, you get your delta H on the top, delta S on the bottom. Please remember that that is joules, and that is kilojoules. Are we still on camera? Yes, we're still on camera. That's kilojoules, so you need to make sure they're both in the same unit. I got 3,000 Kelvin, um, but don't flap too much um, if you did not get that. Uh, guys... And the reason it says pickups and timeouts, the biscuits for my son to get. Oh, right, sorry. Um, some oxygen can. Uh, what have we got here? All oh, right, a two mark. Um, minimum mass. Yeah, no unit. There's no unit given in this question, just for a change. Uh, it's one of these proportion calculations, isn't it? I've said here, it tells you that 0 0.38 litres of oxygen are released in one minute from this compound, and we need, uh, why did it multiply it by 480 minutes? That's the number of minutes in eight hours. So we need to release that number of litres, and that's per person, so we mul multiply it by five to get for the five people. That's, I think, the volume of oxygen we needed. Now, it tells us that 106 grams, that's a mole, it doesn't actually tell the GFM, the being stingy, but that, I think, is the GFM of sodium chlorate. Uh, releases 36 litres, and we require 912 litres. Do the sums, that's the mass, but you need a unit here. Could well be wrong. Um, <clears throat> number two. Where are we? Oh, orders. Yeah, this is quite a nice question. I like this one. Um, I've done two different colours here to, show, to try and show what I'm doing here. I think it's HGCl. Sorry, I think it's first order with respect to mercury chloride, because if you double this, you're... Sorry, you're dividing that by two. You also divide that by two. Um, and for the oxalate ion, you have multiplied the concentration here. Are we on the count? Yes, we are. By two, and that gets multiplied by four. So I think it's first and second order. 
Um, if you have messed that up, or if I've messed it up, in fact, don't worry, you still get follow through marks. That's what the FT is for there. So um, this would be the right equation. And you put whatever orders you think are appropriate. Got to be a small K, guys. Uh, a large K, capital K is equilibrium constant. Then they are really ringing out the marks for this one here because they want the value of the root constant. I got it to be that. As I said when I teach this in the class, sadly there's no sanity check. This, these can be as big or as small as you like. There's no really way to know if I've gone wrong. And then it's algebra with the unit's time, and I get that as the unit. Um, I'm guessing one mark for the number, one mark for the unit. That's how the allocation, but it's just my guess. Uh, this time we're solving for a concentration. Uh, I think I got that, but I've said to myself, maybe check my calculator, it's been really odd last night. Um, so don't take that as, as the word uh, irrefutable. What we got here, how would you check to ensure the precipitation reaction has gone to completion? I covered this in my uh, research in chemistry video. You add extra drops of whatever it is you're putting in the first place and look for a, any extra precipitation. I don't know how much detail they want for this, I'm afraid. Uh, you should dry your sample, obviously. You don't want to weigh the water as well. Um, this was what I got for the percentage of mass of oxalic acid in the spinach leaves. Uh, the, that's the mass of precipitate divided by the GFM of the calcium oxalate, which I think is that. Gives you that number of moles. Um, and that's the same number of moles as the oxalic acid in your original sample. Multiply by the, ba by the mass of the GFM of uh, oxalic acid gives you that. Compare it to the original total mass of the leaves, you get that. Source of information is given as 0.9%. Oh, good. My answer is indeed. Uh, oh, just for the difference, so I can't even use that to double-check my answer. That's sneaky. That's good SQ. I like that. Um, my answer is too low. So I'm going for incomplete dissolution of the oxalic acid because we soaked the spinach leaves in water and then titrated the water, was it? Precipitated, sorry, out of the water. So that would be a logical reason for this. If you've got the wrong answer here, as long as you've given the correct logical answer, you should get a follow-through, I would imagine. Uh, this is a really nice open-ended question. Thank you, SQA. This is a top one here. We should be able to get tons and tons out of this. Don't forget to do lots of diagrams and equations and examples, especially at advanced higher level. You've got to really know your stuff in order to get the correct depth for three marks. So basically, it's, it's absorption and emission spectroscopy, really, isn't it? Um, or titration as well. That would do. And that would do for a methodology. Or, in fact, gravimetric analysis as well. Yeah, it's wide open, that one. I love it. Uh, nickel 2 plus iron. Uh, it means that there's nothing in the 4S. They've been lost. You can include the 4S as long as you put zero with it, or you can just wipe it out completely. Hexaamine nickel 2. Stupid naming rules. Um, one mark. Don't worry if you haven't got it. This is the ligand. This is the ligand here, and it attaches at two points. So it is a bi like somebody with two teeth, just two single front teeth, nothing else. Bidentate uh, ligand. <laughs> um, coordination number, draw a circle around, see how many bonds it cuts. Uh, fully explained. Again, I'm not sure the marking allocation here. Uh, the green complex. The presence of ligands splits your d orbitals. And incoming photons of light are then absorbed um, and it causes promotion of electrons in that split. And then we see the complementary colour. But I'm not sure how that's going to work, I'm afraid, in terms of marks. This is an interesting one. So I hark back to the time before we had the colour wheel when you actually had to be able to figure out what colour something might be. Although they're not using it in this context here. It's quite nice. Using information from the graph, explain which ligand has the greater ability to split the d orbitals. Now, the larger the split, um, the higher frequency of light that is absorbed. And so the lower frequency that you see, I've just realised, I think I might have got this the wrong way around. This is a real twist of this question. So this is absorbance. Oh, no, no, it's easy. This is absorbance. So uh, the solid line here, and this isn't, ah, yeah, this is the old, as frequency goes up, wavelength goes down trick. So in other words, the shortest wavelength is the highest frequency and the largest gap. Nope, I got my answer right. That's a real brain twister, though, especially if you're not a physics person. Uh, many compounds containing hydrogen and iodine. 
equilibrium expression here. So we need to raise this to the power of 2, and these just stays the power of 1. This is a calculation. Rory, I wonder, we've done these before, Rory, haven't we, a few times? I wonder how you got on, man. I wonder how I got on. It's quite possible I'm wrong. Um, at the start, we had 0.25 of this, 0.25 of this, and none of the hydrogen iodide. At equilibrium, it's telling us that we had 0 0.015 moles of iodine left. We also would have had 0 0.01 moles of hydrogen left because it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So if you do the calculations on how much has actually reacted, we find that that number of moles there of the hydrogen or the iodine has reacted. And you can use that to work out how many moles of the hydrogen iodide um, you're going to have in the mixture because it's a one-to-one -to, -one to two. So take that and multiply by two and you end up with this. So that's present of the hydrogen iodide at equilibrium. These two are present of the two reactants. Do the sums on this. Did I forget to square that? No, I did square it. And 92 I got for K value. Sounds vaguely reasonable, but I suppose I'll know in a few months' time when the marks come out. Might be embarrassed. Um, John, John McKinnon, this is your question, John. Um, so, E equals HFL, or if you do some substitutions, E equals HCL over lambda. Pop the numbers in, remembering that's nanometers there. And we got, this comes out in joules, so that's the number of kilojoules, which is what they actually want, so 207. Um, sounds about right, actually. Don't think I made a mistake in that one. Sounds a feasible energy level for reddish yellowy light. Uh, this was an interesting one to ask. Very specific detail. Name the type of funnel that should be used to carry out vacuum filtration. I came up with Buchner funnel, which is the general name for it. Robbie. Uh, has sintered glass. Ooh, sintered glass. He's right, of course. I don't know why I'm taking them in, so... Um, what was it you were voted again, Robbie? Um, most likely two. I can't remember. Uh, the distillate contained 251 grams of hydrogen iodide. So, a percentage yield. Uh, it's a one to two reaction here, guys. Uh, so, I'm working out the theoretical mass here. Here's the GFM of iodine, here's the GFM of hydrogen iodide, times two, of course. I forgot to multiply by two initially. <laughs> Easy mistake to make. See, the theoretical mass of 287, we got... I could have caught that mistake, of course. I would have ended up with a percentage of more than 100. We're getting 87. That's a pretty good yield. Sorry, helps when it's... Was that, I hope that was on the page. 87.4%. Per iodic acid can be used to oxidise diols with neighbouring hydroxyl groups. Never heard of it. Must be a problem-solving one. So basically, we've split this molecule here, and each carbon now, instead of having a hydroxyl, has got a carbonyl attached to it. So it's karate chop time. If you do the same with this, an unwind... This is interesting. This is really interesting, actually. There's a very similar question in this year's hire to do with cyclic esters. Somebody been writing a question and taking it up a level. It's a clever idea if they have. So we chop it there, unwind it, I counted all the carbons, I think we end up with this. Draw a structural formula, don't need to name it, all is good. Some sort of weird dialyde thing. Um, oh, I got that wrong, because they made ketones. No, no, aldehyde or ketones. There's a ketones because there were no hydrogens. Ah, whereas we did have... Yeah, we must have a hydrogen on that one. All good. All good, I think. Uh, okay, okay. Around half the carbon dioxide produced... Uh, carbon dioxide dissolves in water to form carbonic acid. Yeah. Um, carbonic acid. I've just finished doing the higher paper. That's why. And I had a slight... Uh, ah, that doesn't work. Anyway, I'll move on. So there's the question. It's, it's exothermic as you look at it. So that's that way is exothermic. Not sure the details required here. That's why there's lots of question marks. Basically, as you raise the temperature, the equilibrium will move to the left. It's almost like a higher question. This reducing the dissolved carbon dioxide. Um, but it's only one mark, so I can't see them looking for a lot of detail in it. Explain how the strength of carbonic acid compares with ethanoic acid. I went to the data book and looked up the P, sorry, the Ka of ethanoic acid. And I used the reverse like shift log of negative 6.35 to work out the Ka of carbonic acid. 
um, and a higher Ka number is a stronger acid, and we can see that this is a couple of powers of 10 higher than that, so ethanoic acid is stronger. So a lot of work for one, one, one mark. Maybe I'm overthinking that. I don't know. Um, the H2O is acting as a base because it's absorbing the hydrogen ions. Don't think you need to lose space. I think it's just a base. Hey. Interest, yeah, hydronium ions in surface water, it's, it's shift log of negative 8.2. It's just exactly the same calculation that I used across the other page, which makes me think I was overthinking that other question. Okay. I got that. Um, a calculation of hydronium ions with 8.2. Which sounds a bit right, by the way, because that means it's lower than 7, lower than minus 7, which is, is for neutral, of course. Um, two marks for this one. Calculate the percentage increase in hydronium nice wee problem solving one here so I reversed the pHs for these two I then did a subtraction and then put the difference which was that over the initial reading which was the 8.2 one and I came across a 99.5% difference I'm not convinced I've done that correctly question mark for this one yeah steps needed to do a back titration I'd, I'd love to know what level of detail they're looking for this one. Measure the mass, uh, an exact mass of shell, and dissolve it in an exact volume, but also an excess quantity of hydrochloric acid. The, ex, the leftover hydrochloric acid you would then titrate with your sodium hydroxide. Mm, don't know. Don't know how much, how many marks I'll get for my answer there. Name a control substance. Yeah, it just calcium carbonate from the store. Unless I'm missing something. You would run... The, you would run this experiment with pure calcium carbonate first. And once you know the answer to be 100% or close enough to 100%, then you know the procedure works. And you can actually start to use it in analysis. That's the sort of question that you would be familiar with if we'd done projects this year. Um, Crown ethers are a group of cyclic blah, 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 blah. blah. There's the naming rules. Here we go. Um, so I know this one from the olden days, but the problem is I've done this for 30 years, so I know many of these questions from the past. That, I think, is 15 crown 5. 15 atoms in total and 5 oxygens. Um, lithium ions. That's for potassium, that's for sodium, so presumably if we click down one more pair to the world's worst drawing here, but you can see what I'm at here for a smaller iron. This is definitely it's based on an old question because you had to make... I remember the original question on this. You had to actually draw a conclusion, but that's it. Stop rambling here, you go on with it. Crown ethers can act as ligands because the oxygen atoms have little happy alien heads on them. They are the non-bonded pairs of electrons. That's why they can be ligands. Um, more crown ethers. Molecular formula for triethylene glycol. This guy here. I think that's right, but again, if I've done it wrong, feel free to let me know. I, and I think this is an unusual condensation reaction, but it still fits. You're joining this to this, and you're eliminating HCl and HCl. It's a really unusual conversation. I don't know if they'd accept anything else, but I'm going to go with that one. Uh, this one, for some reason, I haven't done. Uh, let me see if I can perhaps do it at the end, if I remember to come back to it. Sorry about that. Highly unprofessional. This one here. I thought this was initially a lovely one, and then I realised that I misread it completely. Um... Explain how the different information provided by these and other representations helps a chemist decide when to use a particular type. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure about that one. As in, I'm not sure about what I would put for that one. I'll maybe try and come back to it at the end. Uh, cyclohexene is in a cycloalkene, so we're stuck this to this. We've shifted the double bonds. We've actually destroyed these double bonds and that one and replaced it with just a single one. So uh, what's going on here? Conjugated system, alternating single and double bonds or SP3, SP2 hybridizations. You can put that as well. Uh, the carbon atoms in buta-1,3-diene, they are all SP2 hybridized. Similar addition reactions, can we just make another? Oh, okay, so if we just stick these two together then, destroy these two, destroy that, and put a double bond in there, I think you get that? With the methyl branch and the cyanide here, and I'm assuming skeletal's okay, it doesn't say anything else in there, so I'm assuming skeletal is okay, considering the rest of the questions in skeletal notation. Um, explain why the chlorine molecules become polarized when chlorine is reacting with the double 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Cyclohexene. Yeah. Cyclohexene reacts with chlorine. Thought I'd misread that. The high electron density in the pi bonds, uh, in the pi bond, singular, there's only one, uh, affects the shared pair of electrons here. They get repelled to one side, and that's what polarizes the chlorine molecule. Not sure how to put that into words, especially for only just one mark. You could, I suppose, do it diagrammatically. Um, for some reason, I'd, this is a really interesting. Talk about a Freudian slip, if you know what that is. I actually wrote it as bromine because it's an addition reaction involving a halogen. Now, this is the reason I've said this is because the textbooks and the SQA, <laughs> the carbocation formation or this triangular intermediate. Certainly the triangular intermediate is formed with bromine. That is for 100% sure. I went searching through the research papers to see if I could find what happens with chlorine. See, chlorine's smaller, a fair chunk smaller than bromine. It's definitely not going to happen with fluorine. You would get a carbocation with fluorine. But I don't know whether they'll accept either of these two. I'd love to see the answer scheme when it comes out. Because I can't find any evidence anywhere in the research on that. But if there are any other chemistry teachers out there, feel free to comment. Um... Explain why 1,2-dichlorocyclohexane has geometric isomers. I think I'd probably do a diagrammatic version of this. Um, the two, the chlorines can be both above uh, the ring. I'm not going to try and draw it uh, 3D here. They can be the same side of the ring, or one can be on top and one can be in the bottom here. Hi. Miss Davison, how are you doing? Quick shout out to Miss Davison there. Uh, right, where are we? We are on... Yeah, so above, both above the ring, or one above and one below. Um, that's how it has geometric isomers, despite not having a double bond. Do you need to mention the fact the ring can't twist? I don't know. It's a lot of detail for one mark. Draw a cyclic isomer of 1,2-dichlorohexane, cyclohexane, sorry, that does not have an optical isomer. You've got to have a carbon that doesn't have four different things on it. So I think either of these two would be correct. Let me know if you think I've messed up. Uh, the reaction between cyclohexene and HCl this time. Right, we're definitely on carbocation intermediate here. Uh, so, structural formula for the notation of this. I'm never quite sure how this is allocated. Perhaps one mark for the correct reactant and product, and another mark for the curly arrow usage being correct. Anyway, this is going to come out of here and attack this. The shared pair of electrons is going to pop onto here. So you're going to left with this is your hydrogen here. This is your carbocation. Your chloride is hanging about, waiting to find somebody to talk to at the party. And then the pair of electrons jumps onto here and you end up with that. Quick way to check you've got it right. This should be the same total charge for all three of these. Zero, zero, zero. This was a problem solving one. I... I, I hope I've got it right. Not entirely convinced. Sounds reasonable. That's a sneaky bit there in metres. Uh, why did I say that was in sneaky? I can't remember. Why? Oh, because that's nanometers. Um, so got to watch for that. Got to watch for the conversion. Assuming I've done it correctly, of course. Paracetamol. Uh, the formula for the electrophile in this reaction, this is ni the nitronium. The formula they want rather than the name. This one. Okay, fair enough. Uh, this is a nice... I remember this from university course a long time ago. It's coming back to me now, unlike my hairline. Oops, sorry about that. Slight jump in there. Uh, I remember this has come back to me now. Um, this rotation of double bonds. It's problem solving, but I think they've given you enough clues to follow this. So it's follow the dominoes, isn't it? It's domino toppling. So this negative charge pops down into here. This negative pair of electrons from the pi bond pops onto here. And you end up with this structure. So if we repeat that process, we'll take the negative charge, pop it onto there. This will collect up on... It's actually collecting up on there. My apologies. Mm, that's interesting. I wonder if we would have lost a mark for that. So you end up with a negative charge there. Yeah, probably would have lost a mark for that, actually. Yes. Attention to detail here. I think uh, that's the arrows, and then that's the structure, as far as I'm aware. Reasonably easy two marks, but I like it. It's, it's problem-solving, indeed. Uh, where are we? 11B. There we go. Sorry, let me move this. There's not paper to be going on with you. There we go. 4-nitrophenol is used to make 4 Uh This is a reduction because it's a clever... It's not one you know, but it's changing the oxygen to hydrogen ratio. Um, so I'm hoping you can work out its reduction in this one. Uh, a tough one, but a fair enough one. Um, suggest a reagent used to carry out this reaction. Uh... 
yeah, this is a naming, and then we've bonded ourselves this onto it. Yeah, wasn't this reaction in the multiple choice? This reaction where you neutralise the carboxylic acid with an amine um, and then form the salt and then you heat the salt uh, and it drives water off. Uh, number D, what we got? Outline the steps used to... Pu oh, God, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I think there's four steps and I'm not sure how they'll allocate marks. I have no clue on this. So if it was me, I would. First of all, I'd dissolve the sample in the smallest volume of hot boiling solvent. I would then filter it um, through a filter paper, I would then let the filtered solution cool um, and crystallise, and then my fourth step is I would filter it again to obtain the nice pure crystals. But I'm not sure how that's going to... I'm not sure how that's going to allocate for that. Um, M for spectroscopy, I think that's a carbonyl bond um, there that's present in paracetamol, that carbonyl bond there. I can't think of any offhand. I've got a feeling I got made a mistake in this last year. Uh, this one here, I'm not sure what they're looking for here. But considering the functional groups present in paracetamol suggests why the peaks above 3,000 are difficult to assign to specific bonds. Above 3,000. So this area here, I know what I would say as a chemist. I would say that OH causes something called an OH stretch, which it's because it's hydrogen bonded, it means that one molecule goes twang but because, literally twang, you know, it vibrates. And because it's hydrogen bonded to the next molecule, that also goes twang. So it spreads it out across a variety of different molecules. And it produces this characteristic big dip here, unlike these nice sharp spikes. But none of that's in the course. So maybe I'm just overthinking this and looking for an easier answer. Is it the presence of the benzene ring they're looking for, maybe? Because it's got echoes up above 3,000. Um, is it because of hydrogen bonding? Is it because all the groups in this molecule show up above 3,000? It could be as simple as that. And I'm maybe just overthinking it. I don't know. We'll find out in August, eh? Analysis of a high-res NMR spectrum of this. I like this. This is nice. Um, so if we have a look at this, there are one, two, three, four, five environments, five hydrogen environments. The singlet and singlet and singlet are... Uh, I've got myself doubting myself now. Well, that's interesting. Hmm. No, 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 no. That's a singlet. That's a singlet. That's a singlet. Get it together, hey. Despite having three hydrogens, of course, that is not what affects it. It's the number of hydrogens on the next-door neighbour carbon, which is nothing and nothing and nothing, and there isn't a next-door neighbour carbon. So, yeah, these are the three singlets. Lovely. Uh, that affects the... That's why I've circled that. There's three times as many of these as the other ones. That's how I know that's that one. Answer the question, hey, stop rattle, rambling on. Circle the proton environment and the structure below that's responsible for 2.1. Oh, no, I did. That's, that's the answer there. That environment there. Do you have to do all three? Probably not. Just one of them will do. It just means you've identified the correctly which one's which. Complete the table by naming the multiplets would be seen from 6.7 and 7.3. So that, these two, would have to be your aromatic hydrogens. And each of these is equivalent to each other. Um... But on the neighbouring carbon here, there's nothing. On this neighbouring carbon, there's one. So n plus one means one plus one is two. It will be a doublet or a double or a twin. It like, doesn't have to be doublet. It sounds like a piece of clothing from the Witcher. A low-res NMR spectrum is going on here, guys. Um, explain what conclusion can be made about the purity of this. Well, I said earlier on there's five environments and we're getting one, two, three, four, five. That's the TMS signal. That's your calibration signal. It's not an environment. So I would say that your five peaks, uh, it's lovely and pure. Uh, your paracetamol that you've made. And describe a different technique to check the purity. Your mixed melting points, or just melting point, full stop, doesn't have to be mixed melting point. If you took the melting point, it would be the same as the literature value. If you added paracetamol to it, extra pure paracetamol, that is, to your sample, then you would find no difference in the melting point. For two marks, I think they might be aiming for this. But this one's totally valid here. You just look up in a book and find out what the precise melting point is and then measure your sample and see how close it is. I don't think they're looking for paper chromatography or anything else. Maybe they are. If you put paper chromatography, I don't see that being bad. Um, I don't know. Thank you so much for listening. Bye, folks.